bonjour à toutes et à tous. Bienvenue dans cette édition spéciale de Résiliart, un débat qui intervient alors que l'UNESCO participe à la célébration de 2021, année internationale. Welcome, welcome all to this special edition of Résiliart, a debate which is part of UNESCO celebrating of the International Year of the Creative Economy for Sustainable Development as declared by the United Nations uh, in 2021. Uh, this is the the theme of our discussion is going to be build back better through creative economy and we have with us Jean-Michel Jarre who is a highly connected composer one of the most famous French musicians in the world and a reference in electronic music you had an unforgettable hit called Oxygen. You have always been a pioneer in the 1980s with your semicircular synthesizer with uh, light uh, keys and the uh, laser harp you had in, uh, and then early 2021 with Welcome to the Other Side, a virtual concert in Notre Dame in Paris, which was followed by over 75 million spectators in the world. You've sold more than 85 million records throughout the world and you've given spectacular concerts everywhere from Moscow to Shanghai uh, and even in uh, the Mont Saint-Michel in Normandy. And now you are a source of interesting thoughts uh, about new technologies and their consequences on our humanity as such. We are also going to be graced to the presence of Abderrahman Sissako, who is a filmmaker and producer, Bamako Timbuktu, Life on Earth and Rostov Luanda. Africa is more than your cradle, it is also your muse. It seems to be at, at the spring of your cinema. It's political, it's poetic as well. And, uh, and film viewers were struck uh, with with emotion, particularly when they saw uh, your masterpiece in 2014, Timbuktu, which was rewarded by several French Caesars, best film and best director, but was also nominated at Cannes and at the Oscars. And recently you also directed theater uh, on at the Theater du Châtelet with a contemporary opera called uh, The Theft of the Bully. Vanya Kalujacic is our third guest. She is the director of the International Film Festival of Rotterdam, IFFR, which is being held this very week, February 1st through 7th, online, of course, because of uh, the pandemic. Vanya, you've uh, traveled very far in the film industry, both internationally and uh, in Holland. You've particularly worked for a video on demand site called Mubi, where you were uh, in charge of purchasing, but you've been involved in a lot of different film festivals, such as the Berlinale, uh, the uh, Sarajevo Film Festival, and also the Film Festival of Les Arcs. We also have with us Thomas Stevens, who is the director and chairperson of Primephonic. This is a specialized uh, music streaming service which does classical music. Thomas Stevens is, is a classical music lover and he explained to us that this platform was needed because the popular platforms such as Spotify of Deezer were leaving uh, the this, this space open as they never produced, never uh, streamed classical music, but only pop music. But Steven, uh, Stevens is also a member of the Dutch Council for the Arts, uh, which is an advisory board of, to the Dutch government concerning all issues that have to do with the arts and culture. Finally, we have Victoria Contreras, who is the founder and director general of Connecta Cultura in Mexico, an international reference of of cultural management. You have managed social uh, innovation projects and, and promoted culture and development in Latin America and have 15 years experience in managing international cultural and social projects, particularly connecting the Americas and Europe. So this panel is very representative of diversity uh, in, uh, in culture. And I uh, thank you all for being with us. I want to start with uh, giving the floor to Ernesto Ottone, who is our uh, Assistant Director General for Culture here at UNESCO. I see great friends here, Jean-Michel Jarre, who is one of UNESCO's ambassadors of goodwill. I also want to thank Vanya, Thomas, uh, and Abderrahman, and Victoria for being with us today. Over the past year, as we have faced the enormous global challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have all learned the importance of international solidarity and cooperation. No country, no region, and no sector 
from tourists to trade to education has been left untouched by COVID-19, and this includes culture sector. From the very beginning of this crisis, people everywhere have turned to culture as a source of connection, entertainment, and hope. Yet despite its importance, culture has largely been forgotten in COVID-19 recovery efforts around the world. As artists and cultural professionals continue to lose their livelihoods facing acute economic and social insecurity, now is the time to come together to discuss and find safe ways of reopening cultural venues and resuming artistic creation. We must be united to find solutions to have the artists and cultural professionals who have helped us immensely uh, during this time. Just this week, Italy is reopening its cultural sites. I hope that many other countries will soon find ways to follow suit. In April last year, UNESCO launched a global movement, Resiliat. That's a platform for artists and cultural professionals to come together and express their concerns, hopes, and solutions in the face of this crisis. To date, over 240 debates have been organized in more than 110 countries all over the world. UNESCO continues to fulfill its promise to all those who have participated in resilient debates, to share their ideas and concerns with member states and policymakers. Just this week, the preliminary results of the global resilient movement were discussed by the Intergovernmental Committee of UNESCO 2005 Convention on the protection and promotion of the diversity of cultural expression. Nous avons également constaté l'impact direct du mouvement. We have also seen the direct impact of Resiliat as a movement in the field. Uganda. Uganda was the first country to join Resiliat. It organized its first debate, Resiliat, on the very uh, morn of the launching of the movement. And they took this mission to heart, managed to bring together many artists and professionals around six discussions, and they put special emphasis on the film sector using those film uh, actors who had been mobilized uh, by the technical assistance project run with uh, Uganda by the uh, European Union and UNESCO. And the direct consequence of these discussions and, uh, of, and of the uh, needs expressed during this discussion by Uganda's cultural workers is that Uganda created an online platform for Uganda's filmmakers to make their films available for free, which uh, makes the public have easier access to Ugandan films. And the cost of the data necessary to operate this platform is subsidized in return for uh, the artists need to um, uh, access uh, affordable data. And the platform gives the government help in return. It gives the, the, the government uh, useful information about the film consumption habits of Uganda. And Uganda's example is a good example of cooperation and, and of ways to act. We are all involved in defending cultural expression, which is essential to the world, whereas huge platforms and producers are dominating the creation and the dissemination of cultural content. It is up to us to safeguard the diversity of cultural expressions, and it is up to us to protect independent artists, emergent and young artists, and women artists. The year 2021 is the international year of the creative economy at the service of sustainable development, and UNESCO has joined a UN uh, Young TAD for uh, the implementation of this uh, International Year of Creative Economy for Sustainable Development, organizing a number of activities to shed light on the power of creativity. On February 1st, UNESCO launched this celebration with messages from the United Nations General Assembly and representatives of multilateral, multilateral agencies and the President of Colombia. The year 2021 must be a year of action. We must build back better together with the creative economy and develop new partnerships for the creative sectors of tomorrow. And we must make sure that those who work at each step of the creative value chain from creation, production and distribution to access are all represented. And the organizations of civil society may fill the gaps and make sure that represent representation is even stronger. As Naomi Kawase was saying only two days ago, during a Resiliat debate, uh, after the plague, the Renaissance bloomed. We must make, m do our very best to make sure that the enormous challenges we face today are all re rewarded in the end by unlimited creativity. And who better than today's panelists who all represent various sectors of the cultural industries 
who is better placed to explore the possibility of building back better with the creative economy. I want to thank you all for joining us and I hope that your exchanges will be fruitful. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Ernesto, for having given us this, uh, for these essential uh, messages. Yes, we need to build back better with the uh, creative economy and use the creative economy for a sustainable development. And we must make sure, as you just said, make sure that each worker in the creative chain, including production, distribution and access, that they should all be represented. We have to find solutions for them all and save those artists who have been saving us ever since the beginning of the pandemic, bringing us that oxygen, that fresh air that we all needed so very much, particularly during lockdowns. So here we all are today to act together. We need to find concrete actions, concrete solutions, and that's what we're going to discuss with our panelists, the ones I just introduced earlier. How to build back better in a creative and sustainable way. Let me start with you, Jean-Michel Jarre. You are an artist and famous, uh, and a famous one, uh, but recently you have been working hard for younger creators, for emerging artists. Are you calling for the creation of a new business model for the cultural sector? Can you remind us what the main issues are that we need to solve? Jean-Michel Jarre, je me permets votre micro. Jean-Michel Jarre, I think pardon, your microphone voilà. is not on. Pardon, pardon. Oh. Sorry. Je disais exactement, c'est un comble pour, en ce qui me concerne. Donc, salut tout le monde, et, bien entendu, salut well, mes amis Ernesto et Abderrahman et hi, les, Ernesto, tous les amis qui hi, sont ici réunis pour justement essayer de, de contribuer à, à faire changer les choses. Comme yes, vous l'avez rappelé, je vais, pour respecter la diversité culturelle, je m'exprimerai donc aujourd'hui en français et en anglais. Et donc, je vais commencer par ma langue natale, le français. Comme vous le rappeliez, effectivement, j'ai le privilège, moi, de pouvoir vivre de mon travail depuis le début de ma carrière. Et donc, aujourd'hui, si je m'inquiète, je m'inquiète pas pour moi, je m'inquiète pour les générations à venir. Je m'inquiète pour les générations qui, aujourd'hui, se retrouvent dans une situation catastrophique, dans un secteur qui, il faut le rappeler au gouvernement, Sector, et 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 qui nous écoutent, le secteur culturel, ce n'est pas une niche sur le plan économique, c'est plus important que l'industrie de l'automobile, plus important que ça représente les industries créatives, représentent ne serait-ce qu'en Europe 7 millions d'emplois, 2 millions d'emplois seulement dans la musique, euh, et aujourd'hui, 30% de ces emplois sont en grand danger. Et si on ne fait rien, euh, c'est un, un, un pan de notre identité à tous en tant que citoyens de la planète qui est remis en cause. Et ce que je voudrais dire, c'est que, euh, effectivement, euh, on, pendant cette période de confinement, on a fait deux choses. On est sorti pour se nourrir, et puis euh, on a euh, écouté de la musique, on a regardé des films, on a lu des livres, et que si on avait besoin de se le That's prouver à nous-mêmes, euh, finalement, on, euh, on peut, euh, il est établi clairement aujourd'hui plus will, que jamais que la culture, que la musique, que le cinéma, no que music, la littérature culture, sont des biens cinéma, euh, books, culturels de première nécessité. Et je dirais même qu'aujourd'hui, je, je suis ici devant cet écran et je ne suis pas dans la rue à Paris pour manifester avec, mes, avec mes collègues and, and artistes uh, sur le fait que, street, de ne pas oublier de rappeler que les théâtres, les musées sont des services publics au même Because niveau I want to que remind you that theaters, que, euh, cinemas, euh, les, euh, concert venues are as la essential sociale, as the post donc, office cela, or uh, uh, any shop in le, town. Je, je commence par ça. C'est pour And uh, why is it so uh, justement le, le fait d'alerter les gouvernements que au fond, la culture, plus que jamais, doit être un cheval de, fro de froid pour notre Today, renaissance. Aujourd'hui, je pense que le Trojan Horse de la future 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 de And, uh, uh, the, and we have a lots of possibilities to do that. First of all, through UNESCO, to uh, send clear message of one voice. Because uh, 
you know, um, I'm living in France. French people are very uh, uh, popular to uh, complain about everything, but it's even much worse in lots of other countries where the government is in, much more absent than uh, in, uh, in my home, home, home country. And I think that we, we have to, uh, uh, to and I think that will be one of the purpose of the, this uh, panel, and then, then I, will, I will pass the floor to my colleagues, uh, just to say that, first of all, we have also to ask ourselves if we want to save the culture as citizens of the planet. It's not only the, to the governments we have to address this message, it's to ourselves. I mean, we, we, uh, uh, we have citizens of the planet, we are part of our identity, part of, of our human rights, I mean, is the cultural aspect of our day-to-day -day life. We, in every family, we have a, a child dreaming, becoming a photographer, a filmmaker, a musician, a writer. If we don't take care of this, all these, all these kids, they are going to work at Uber in the next few years. This is exactly what, 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 uh, what it is. And, uh, and then we have also another um, uh, thought to, uh, and, 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 and another plan to, uh, to organize, is our, uh, uh, to organize ourselves regarding the GAFA. And I think that we will have some time to talk about this uh, later on. There is a real strategy to have uh, all together uh, to think about, uh, about all these giants of the internet, stopping, stopping maybe uh, whining and, uh, and considering them our enemies, but as potential partners. And I would be happy to develop this uh, in, uh, in uh, I mean, a bit later in the panel, but I, I will leave the floor to my colleagues, of course. Thank you, Jean-Michel Jarre. And yes, we'll talk about that again. On, parle, on reparlera uh, du rôle des GAFA un petit peu Indeed, plus we will uh, discuss the role of the GAFA uh, a little later during uh, this discussion. Abderrahman Sissako, can you tell us what challenges uh, you are meeting these days, as well as other professionals in uh, the performing arts and, and uh, in cinema? You uh, organized a contemporary opera called Le Vol du Boli, which was played on the stage of the uh, Théâtre du Châtelet in Paris in October. Now, originally, this, this was supposed to be shown for three weeks. And then, because lockdown struck again, there were three performances which were all sold out, which uh, demonstrates that uh, people miss it. People miss the theater. Now, how did, how did that feel for you? Le micro of the Raman comme moi. Ah, bon. uh, <laughs> uh, bonjour. Bonjour. Microphone, please. Salut. Yes, it's working now. Très bien. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, indeed, we can. So, I just said hi. Thank you very much, uh, Jean Michel, for your introduction. You said briefly, but very accurately, that uh, the concerns of any artist today in Europe or in Africa, uh, well, you stated those concerns. So let me just start by saying that uh, I feel I'm lucky compared to tens of thousands of artists in Africa, musicians, uh, uh, movie directors, who for a year already have been in dire circumstances you know that in uh, Africa, we don't have any policies or government agencies that support the artists' role in society. We don't make much money. We are in the informal economy, as it were. And when such a tragedy as this one hits, <clears throat> well, you can easily imagine the uh, consequences for creativity uh, on artists. When an artist has to stay silent, and I'm talking about talking about a musician, or when an artist um, can no longer work, paint, dance, you know, the, they have to stop moving. Well, I think that makes uh, humankind all the poorer. And so I'm in a very lucky position, but I have to say that this was also uh, thanks to the huge help uh, given to me by the Théâtre du Châtelet, it was uh, 
preparations lasted at least two years. Uh, it took a lot of people working a lot on this project, and we were lucky enough to be able to have three shows, to put three shows on. So quite a few people got to uh, see the show. And so I think in this situation, we have a unique opportunity to alert uh, public authorities and everyone else to uh, really highlight how vulnerable the human species is, you know, how fragile we are. I think the past year has completely shown that, you know, sometimes uh, we have been too um, reckless, perhaps, um, unthinking in how we just treat the environment, for example, the, uh, uh, you know, rich people are becoming even richer, even in this pandemic, and the other part of the world, more than half, is getting poorer. So we are at a unique juncture where we have to rethink, you know, balance in the world. We need more sharing. Uh, our world is very rich, wealthy, and all that, all those riches are very unequally shared. Thank you very much, uh, Abderrahman Sissoko. It is true what you say, many areas of the world, culture is considered as a luxury, not necessarily as a human, a basic human right. Film Festival, the Rotterdam Film Festival, which is also celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. You've come up with a unique way of holding this event. Can you share with us uh, what has changed and how you have managed to adapt to the restrictions due to the pandemic, due to the pandemic, sorry? How have you reinvented the festival? Yeah, uh, thanks first and foremost for having me. It's uh, an honor to be in this group. And uh, indeed so, the 50th edition of our, our festival, the IFFR, is currently in full swing. And the shape of it, as you uh, said in the question already, it's very different from what we're used to here in Rotterdam. So with already first wave of lockdowns, which was happening early in March, uh, it's now almost a year ago, it became very clear for us uh, from a very early stage that this global health crisis will prevent us from uh, planning the festival as or carrying it out in the way uh, we know it and we are used to it. And we are talking about a festival that is gathering over 300,000 visitors. So this is why uh, very early on with the entire team, we started preparing for different scenarios and developing a contingency plans and all of this with uh, keeping in mind that measures and restrictions by the government could be changed at any given moment which of course over the time happened um, happened many times because of course also the circumstances have uh, changed quite clear and what became very clearly uh, quite clear from early on is that we would not be able to cater to all of our stakeholders uh, and communities at the same time. And by that, we mean uh, the community of filmmakers, the audience, the partners, and of course, um, uh, other stakeholders that we as a festival uh, serve towards. So uh, what we have come up with uh, in the end is that we have divided our festival in, uh, in a multi-part hybrid event spanning from February till all the way till June. And currently uh, we are having uh, the first part of the festival and in the full swing. Thank you, Vanya. And may I just briefly ask you, did you manage to uh, share a bit of the usual festival vibe? Uh, have you, uh, do you already have an idea of the figures? Uh, was the audience there? Well, I can definitely say that the opening night was better than ever. We had an audience outreach that now counts in several thousands, which of course, with a, even if you fit all this audience in a couple of cinemas, we wouldn't be able to achieve these numbers. So. Uh, what we can see is that there is a different outreach, that it's all of a sudden more democratic, of course, uh, on the level on, of Netherlands, for instance, and uh, because we also noticed that uh, our audiences adapt as well. So it's not only the culture in our industry that had adapted, but audience that is currently deprived from accessing everything else physically also took this challenge upon themselves. So uh, we can see really uh, how our film lovers are 
so uh, passionately participating in all of the activities because after each screening of the competition titles that we currently have, we can see filmmakers interacting with the audience directly and um, these debates are, are quite amazing. So the reactions are immediate. We can see that for sure. Thank you, Vania. Uh, Thomas Stevens from uh, Prime Phonic. Uh, since the first lockdown measures appeared around the globe, streaming services have seen an important increase of their subscribers. Uh, is that the case for you? And if so, by how much? How has the pandemic changed uh, your platform? Yeah, um, quite a bit. Uh, indeed, uh, well, I say this with a kind of a bittersweet feeling in that I know that most people employed in the arts are uh, having very hard and dire times. Indeed, we see in the streaming environment, whether that's video or audio, actually an, a, a strong increase in listenership. So I think in our case, I think the number of users has increased by more than 50%. But we also see that people are listening more minutes per day. So not only more people are streaming, but also more people per day. Uh, more minutes per day are being streamed per person. And there's two interesting things to add to that. Uh, the first is we see actually more older people streaming now. So people who in the past did not really feel, let's say, connected to the digital um, world. And now, let's say, with all the venues closed, they are pretty much forced to embrace, um, let's say, uh, um, um, let's say the, 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 the digital opportunities that nowadays uh, exist. So we see more older users coming in. And we see more younger users coming in because younger people now often have more time that they can't go to the gym or to their friends anymore. We see now that they are doing more trainings and stuff. So we also have an online beginner course in classical music where we see um, that younger people are um, 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 checking in. And the third thing we see is that people are taking more time to explore music they didn't know yet. So pre-corona, most of our users were listening to the same music all the time. And now we see that people are taking the time to explore new composers, music from countries that typically would not um, listen to. And that brings me uh, to, to my final point, which is, yes, I understand we, many people are facing very dire challenges at the moment, but I'm optimistic about the years thereafter. Because I think that the lockdowns show to people in my country and in many countries, I mean, a lockdown is hard, but a lockdown without music, without books, without TV series and films would be much harder. So I think there is an increasing awareness on the important role that the arts play in our daily lives that perhaps in the past was overlooked. And second, I think we see that there is now more momentum for digital distribution of the arts, which can allow for more discovery and also for a broader access of people who in the past uh, were not consuming the culture. So I think there is momentum now that if we can tap it, actually the cultural sector can get stronger out of COVID than it was before. Uh, but first, we have to survive in the coming months, of course. Thank you, Thomas Stevens. Victoria Contreras, uh, you're a member of a civil society organization. What are the is issues and challenges you've witnessed? How, how have you addressed them? And perhaps since we've heard viewpoints from Europe and Africa, have you seen some differences in your region? Uh, yes, thank you, Valerie. Uh, I'm so glad to be here with this group because I am a Mexican and also a Latin American uh, person. And I think uh, many of the audiences want to be in, in this kind of uh, debate. Well, uh, for Connecta Culture and me in 2020, the biggest problem was the cancellation of our projects and contract. Uh, I mean, like uh, around 85%. Like many civil society organizations, we face mobility restrictions for face-to-face -face work, and there have been no public actions clearly aimed at supporting the cultural sector during the pandemic. So Conecta Cultura, what did? Write, reconnect, start doing, and communicate better. So we create a kind of a new narrative and engagement plan with our alliances and audiences in Latin America principally. For example, new digital communication channels, because in the past we only work in the territories and in a presential uh, work. New online courses and sale of some souvenirs. We invested all also with our own budget in the payment of online platforms 
graphic design and digital market. That's it. We also reduce our team to a minimum. So now for the better, I think in the pandemic, 90% of our projects are digital. Uh, about your question about similarities, we feel in Mexico and Latin America more similarities with Africa. In general, Latin America and Africa are very similar, pretty similar in terms of the high level of creativity of its communities and entrepreneurs. And, but we have to improve our professional capabilities and we have little support from the public policies for culture and art. So the creativity is so important, but also the persons who work in the arts and culture have to improve their capacity buildings to be much more uh, ready to face these challenges during the pandemic. Gracias, Victoria Contreras. Uh, merci. Uh, comme vous l'avez tous rappelé, ces derniers mois nous ont bien prouvé que les arts et la culture sont... As you have all said, these past few months have demonstrated that arts and culture play a crucial role in our lives. And we all agree on that. But we need to do more to uh, convince, to advocate to public authorities and also to uh, get civil society to understand that uh, uh, artists can help with economic recovery. How can we get uh, artists and creators to be seen as uh, 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 economic actors? Uh, Vanya, how do you think that we can get more recognition for, for example, the film industry? How can it uh, contribute to recovery? From books to gaming and movies, uh, culture has stepped up and adapted. So I think it's very important to say that. And um, in the same way, the cinema industry has been incredibly resilient and creative. It completely transformed and adapted to satisfy the audience expectations as well. And we ourselves as a festival are witness to that. And cinema theaters uh, transport their screening rooms and lobbies to welcome audiences safely until they were asked to shut down completely. And on the other hand, distributors worked with online platforms and festivals, and uh, us as a festival worked uh, with funders and local and national institutional funders as well, where government, on the other hand, have adapted their uh, budget accordingly. And uh, IFFR, for instance, uh, is adapting to national and EU regulations as well. Uh, in the Netherlands, measures were adopted to protect labor. However, it is a very bottom-up approach that doesn't necessarily respond to any of the sec sector projections and the experience we have acquired in the last nine months. So supporting the freelancers and precarious workers involved in the cinema industry environment would be a lot more helpful. Uh, even in pandemic situation, IFFR generates 130 jobs, give or take, which is roughly half of the professionals usually involved in the preparation and running of a regular edition. And those are the people who actually now need support more than ever. The speed and lack of coordination has been quite detrimental to the key players in the sector. The long-term economic value of the cultural sector needs, uh, rec uh, needs recognizing because nine months of pandemic experience has not necessarily helped policymakers to reflect and uh, prioritize. So speaking from a European perspective and having myself worked in the industry here through the last economic crisis, I have to say that I think we've already seen some disturbing signals of uh, what's to come if we as a community are not proactive and vocal. Thank you, merci. Uh, Abderrahman Sissako, how do professionals of cinema peuvent-ils... Uh, Thank you, Abderrahman Sissako. How can movie industry professionals uh, adapt to the post-COVID world? You have... Uh, uh, portrayed several poignant stories from Africa and brought that to the large screen. You have uh, uh, Africa is made up of a number of distant countries, but the status of art is not always recognized by govern governments. Uh, uh, it's more often than not an informal sector. What can be done to change those, to change things? Ton micro, Abderrahman. 
Abderrahman, microphone, please. Yes, you have to re uh, unmute your mic every time. I hope you can hear Parfait. me now. Très bien. Yes, we certainly can. Well, I was saying that, that it's, it's a positive thing to underscore the situation of artists in Africa, which was difficult, challenging even before the pandemic. It has not really been acknowledged that we contribute to the economy of countries. And uh, obviously, there's going to be an end to this pandemic. Uh, we have to be optimistic. Uh, you know, that's the way the world goes. We are going to uh, get ourselves out of this. But the first thing we need to realize is that it's very important to realize that we, in particular, the film industry is going to make a contribution. But you have dancers, musicians, all of us, all artists. We are going to make a contribution that has yet to be uh, reckoned, calculated. Uh, we all need music and reading, etc. We have all been affected. How are we going to get out of this rut? Well, that's what art is there for. It's to soothe the soul, uh, to uh, help rebuild as well. Therefore, governments, I think, need to be able to put figures on the contribution of artists, in particular in building back. Thank you very much, Abderrahman. Victoria Contreras, can you tell us how the projects that you invest in contribute to the economic development of Mexico City uh, with a, a positive uh, social impact as well. Victoria, your microphone, your microphone, please. Well, first of all, we do a circular economy with various alias and collaborators in Latin America, not only in Mexico City, because our impact in this moment is in the all half in America. Um, so our impact is a local and a regional level. We strain cultural man management capacities in a contemporary and critical way. This is pretty important for us because, you know, the pandemic exceeds that people think critically about our sector uh, for the solution of problems. We connect with diverse audiences and decision makers, not only in Mexico, but I, I say in Latin America, in a network of flexible collaborations. I think also we inspire people from Latin America to take an active role in cultural and the arts. And I want to say this, that uh, culture is a part of the global solution. It's not a problem. In Spanish, I want to say also that La cultura no es un problema, es parte de la solución. And also, we decided to write some critical texts that analyze the current cultural policies in Mexico principally. And another positive impact is that uh, we get more than 14,000 beneficiaries in the digital arena. This will be very difficult in the previously of the pandemic. So in general, this is our impact during the pandemic. Thank you, Victoria. Merci, Victoria. Jean-Michel Jarre, de quelle façon le secteur musical peut-il... Thank you, Victoria. What about you, Jean-Michel Jarre? How do you, what do you think the musical sector can do to help healing? Je pense que je voudrais d'abord souligner l'importance de l'UNESCO dans ce... Dans, well, dans, firstly, et, I want to point out that UNESCO has a very important role to play. Qu Qu'est-ce qu que ça veut dire, Brésilia? Uh, ça veut dire deux choses. Que is what exactly does Brésilia stand for? Pas seulement les musiciens, mais tous les artistes. C'est la notion de résilience et de résistance. For all artists and not résilience just musicians. sur le fait it, it que nous avons tous resisting. le même problème, que nous soyons artistes de n'importe quel secteur, c'est-à-dire euh, réfléchir à la, à la fin du tunnel et aussi survivre pendant, la, pendant cette fin du tunnel, bien entendu, for, uh, et puis en même temps avoir, euh, qu'on soit artiste ou non, avoir 
cette, euh, cette, cette idée très importante qui était juste soulignée is, avant moi sur le fait que le, la culture n'est pas un problème mais est une solution. Being aware et donc ça m'amène au deuxième is, thème fact, qui est le thème de résistance. Euh, les artistes ont toujours été les garants de la liberté de, de penser, la liberté d'expression, c'est la raison pour laquelle les dictatures s'en défient autant. Et donc nous avons un rôle à jouer pour être aussi toujours fort les artistes pour réagir face aux difficultés. Je pense que les gouvernements doivent, doivent prendre en compte le fait d'aider socialement les musiciens et les artistes de manière plus générale, mais aussi à nous-mêmes, artistes, de pouvoir aussi être, être capables de rebondir. Et je voudrais should, reprendre should, uh, un petit peu ce what Daniel sure and Thomas we were, were uh, pointing out about uh, the importance of new technology. A lot of people are complaining about uh, uh, new technology, the fact that we are in a virtual world and so on and so forth, and it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, and we, we want to go back to uh, uh, to the real world. Of course, I want to go back to. Uh, uh, to a real stage to, to play my music. Of course, I want to, to be in, in touch with, uh, uh, with, with musicians. But also what we have learned during this period is the fact that uh, the, uh, the internet online being, I mean, being able to connect like we are connecting right now, which would, not, which would be maybe even more difficult in the real world today, uh, being able to connect and to connect not only information, but also emotions. And then, Why I'm saying this is actually, I think there is, you know, new mode ex of expressions which could emerge from the pandemic linked to the to new technology. The fact that, uh, for instance, and we should not be afraid of this. You know, uh, uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the, 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 the cinema and movies, uh, at the time of Les Frères Lumière, uh, when uh, movies were projected in circus on white walls, uh, lots of people from the world of theater were saying, but these guys moving on the, on the white wall are not real actors. Uh, real, a real actor is the, 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 the artist being on a real stage in front of a real audience. And the cinema became the, the major art form we know. So we shouldn't be afraid of, of, of technology, but grabbing everything we can, and today, all the, 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 the new mode of expressions emerging from, from, the, uh, uh, from new technology linked to the uh, uh, online and the internet should be really taken on board to help, I mean, uh, uh, reinforcing our, um, our situation. And if I may, I would like quickly to, to uh, uh, talk about our position and our situation regarding internet and regarding the, 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 the giants of the internet. I mean, the, the only people who have uh, made uh, a fortune on the back of the virus are the, 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 big, act, the, the big actors of, of the internet. At the same time, uh, they uh, made uh, lots of money by distributing a content, our content, created by artists and authors who are, uh, who are not able to survive anymore. So there is a kind of total unbalanced situation we have to readjust. And I think that it's time also to sit around a table after, after this, uh, uh, this pandemic with the, uh, uh, the inter internet, um, uh, the, the different platforms, because we, we, we need to share the digital cake in a more balanced part. And I'm talking especially for also emerging countries. But if, if we don't do this, I mean, it's just a, a, an, old, an old part of our civilization worldwide is going to disappear. We need to uh, uh, tell that, uh, as I say sometimes, that in a smartphone, the smart part is us, artists, authors, creators. And, and we need to uh, also, uh, uh, to ourselves, not only to the platforms, I mean, accept that when you are uh, buying a newspaper, uh, in the street, why you, 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 you don't want to accept to buy, to get the same, the same price to buy for the same price on, on the internet, the same content, just because it's on, online. The same for a movie, the same for an album, the same for a photography. I mean, we should ourselves, as part of the civil society, get used to, to, to accept 
that the value of any kind of mode of expressions when it's online has exactly the same value as when it is in the real world. Because that would save uh, 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 lots of our problems. Because at, at the moment, we as citizens of the world have the tendency that culture should be free as the air we breathe. And uh, if we don't do this, as, as somebody said just before, uh, without, uh, uh, without culture, the, 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 this period would have been a total despair and a desert. And it will be even worse after, after the, the pandemic if we don't, uh, and if the, uh, the big actors of the internet are not accepting uh, this. And I think it's time now, you know, I, as you know, I've, I've been president of CISAC uh, for, 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 for six years and I, I went uh, all over the world discussing with politicians and, and people of the, of the media and people of the internet. And you know, it, I, sh things are changing because of, of the pandemic. People are much more ready to listen to us and to listen to uh, uh, the cultural world than before because they've been hit in their own blood, in their own flesh during the lockdown period. And I think this is a very good opportunity for us to, to change paradigm and to uh, uh, also uh, uh, make these giants and these big actors of the internet accepting something that I think they are ready to accept now. We can see that uh, people such as Netflix now, for instance, are, are now ready to, to, uh, uh, to produce movies. Unfortunately, to uh, answer, to find, and just to, to, to uh, answer to your, to your question directly about the music sector, you know, I, YouTube, for instance, is progressing. It's, it's much less uh, the dark Vader of, uh, of the sector than before. But when you see Spotify uh, asking, uh, proposing to uh, artists to, to uh, get less money, uh, to increase their exposure on the platform. When you uh, see Spotify uh, saying to uh, uh, people, please don't give, give some money to artists you, you love, or in some countries even organizing telethons, I would like to, to remind everybody that music and culture is not a disease. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's something what, 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 what needs to be respected. And if we, if we have a request to the government uh, is, is to uh, send this clear message that, you know, uh, artists, authors are uh, doctors of our souls. And we need an urgent vaccine against all these abuses. As you pointed out, Jean-Michel Jarre, there are many opportunities associated with the new technologies. It, it, the, what's at stake is, is creating a system that is fair, a level play, playing field for all actors. That's what's at stake. Thomas Stevens, the public at large doesn't doesn't really know how musical streaming platforms function. Could you, could you give us an idea of what your business model is? How do you generate income? And do you think that your type of platform can contribute to uh, the economic recovery and how? Yeah, absolutely. Well, how, how most streaming services um, uh, work is pretty much that 50%, so half of the revenue is um, uh, paid out uh, to rights holders typically being, in our case, record labels, who then, at their turn, pay out a part um, to um, the artists. But I agree with what has been said, is that there is too many unfair practices in the way how royalties are distributed and, in the end, end up um, with artists, because we are facing a, a world with, let's say, you can't leave this to the market because there is, let's say, an imbalance of power in the market. There's a few big distribution players there is a few very large uh, content uh, owners. And then there is thousands or maybe even millions of artists. And there is an inherent imbalance of power in the market, which is why the governments can't leave it up to the markets like they currently have. And I would also like to, to add to uh, what uh, Abderam and uh, Victoria and Vanya have said. Indeed, only stronger governments uh, uh, can help uh, the cultural sector to contribute to society what it can. But to do that, I think we need to speak a language, we need to speak as a cultural sector more the language of the skeptics, of the people who are not naturally convinced on the value that culture can bring to um, society. And I think that's also where UNESCO can play a role because we're now really moving deep into the 21st century. And people often talk about the 21st century skills. If you look at mankind has increasingly to compete with computer and technology. 
But there is stuff that technology can never do. When you think about lateral thinking, about creativity, about making connections, about aesthetics. So I think the value of the art is only increasing in light of, let's say, uh, the increasing technology of society. I think we're also facing a societal challenge where we see that, uh, as we can, for instance, see in American, but also European politics, that uh, there is more movement on the ex extremes of the political spectrum. Societies are increasingly divided. So what we need is our next generation to be better listeners, to better listen to other people's perspective. And if you look at a painting, you're being forced to think what is this painter trying to say? Which message is he trying to convey? If you are looking to a play, you're being forced for an hour and a half to listen to somebody else and not giving your own view. So I believe the arts can contribute a lot to the challenges of the 21st century, but we need to create a narrative that explains how the cultural sector can do that so that we can convince um, the skeptics. Because if we continue speaking our own language, we are praying to the converted rather than praying to those who still need to be converted. Merci Thomas Stevens. Un, un point qui est eff effectivement uh, très intéressant et à prendre en compte. That uh, is a very interesting point of view. Thank you, Thomas. Before we go on to the uh, next part of the debate, I would like to uh, show you a video sent by the city of Medellin. J'ai souvent vu el contacto de la gente y la vibración hacían que Medellín como ciudad creativa viviera y explorara la música como uno de sus espacios mágicos y sensibles. En el 2020 nos enfrentamos a un reto. Una pandemia hizo que se cerraran todos los escenarios e incluso los eventos en el espacio público se vieron reducidos. Como ciudad de la UNESCO de la música creativa, Nosotros construimos desde Medellín la posibilidad de darle a los artistas y a la ciudad un espacio de encuentro de esparcimiento. Nuestras primeras acciones se encaminaron y se enfocaron en escenarios móviles que recorrieron la ciudad y los barrios donde nunca habíamos llegado. Cada uno de los eventos que la ciudad había construido los transformamos en una transformación digital y también en un encuentro ciudadano a través de recorrer en carros y en caravanas móviles, una ciudad que vibró en medio de la pandemia con el arte y la música. Nuestra ciudad, Medellín, logró en el 2020 continuar con esa energía y esa vitalidad del arte de otra manera. Nuestros eventos como Altavoz, Feria de Flores, los eventos del libro, las redes de prácticas artísticas, la red de música, la red audiovisual, llenaron cada uno de los espacios cotidianos. Hicimos música desde los balcones, desde las casas, Y esto permitió que Medellín siguiera vibrando y viviendo con la música y el arte. Para nosotros, la música, el arte y la creación son esa fuerza y esa energía que en medio de la pandemia le dio la posibilidad a la ciudad de seguir adelante y a los artistas de seguir viviendo a través de muchos estímulos la posibilidad de crear y sobre todo de reinventarse en medio de los momentos más difíciles. Voilà pour ce message de la ville de Medellin qui a... Thank you. That was the message from the city of Medellin, which uh, started uh, taking measures to support its uh, artists. We have been told that we can carry on uh, discussing until 5.30, and we have a lot left to say. As uh, you just mentioned, uh, this, we have been taught a lot by the crisis, particularly about how to best use uh, the digital technologies. The new technologies mean a lot of opportunities, but they also mean new difficulties and, and possibly threats. Abderrahman Sisako, I'm going to give you our first question. What do you see uh, is the impact of the digital tools? How does it impact your work? How does it impact your work as a as an artist, but also in the way you work, how, how does it affect the way you distribute and disseminate your works? And what measures do we need to make sure that the success of such platforms as Netflix or Amazon Prime or, or Disney Plus do not damage the quality of contents and the diversity of cultural expressions and films and series? Well, uh, I think that Jean-Michel is right. There, there's no need to be, did I, am I, can you hear me now? Yes, this time we hear you very well, thank you. I, 
I think that there's no point in being scared of new technologies. We, we have reflexes, negative reflexes. Of course, you can choose to be afraid, but, afraid, uh, being, but fear is not a, 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 a tool for progress. Some of these technologies are amazing. I, I'm com communicating with you through Wi-Fi right now. <laughs> it's working. Now, it's important to remember, as a friend was telling me recently, in, in Africa, we believe in oral culture, and that is a fine thing, but with new technologies, you can't be, you can't speak for free. You have to pay. Internet costs, and not everybody can afford it. So people are dispossessed, and sometimes you wind up spending more on new technologies than on health or education. So, I, I always think it's important to remember that there needs to be a reminder, a reminder that everybody should be able to share in and share out the well, the, the, the wonderful things associated with new technologies. It isn't currently the case. When it comes to creativity, I don't think that Netflix gets in the way of anything. You know, people, humans, will always find inspiration and then there'll always be a big a huge quantity of works and everybody's going to have to make their own choice the tool for distributing uh, creations is increasingly accessible and as the tool is more accessible well culture becomes more accessible it becomes more uh, democratic in a way so there's nothing to be afraid of there there's something's missing, though, in our countries. One thing that's missing is political awareness in, in our governments, political awareness of the need to protect creators. And that they're not aware of that need. You, you, you know of authors' rights and copyrights. There are practically no countries in Africa that actually make sure that some of the money that is earned by their works goes back to the musicians themselves. We just don't have these laws. It's really a problem. And it's only when reminded by the pandemic that, that we realize that we are all vulnerable. There is no such evil, no evil that will not damage me as well. Anything that harms anyone or any place is potentially a danger to me as well. And that's what the pandemic must keep us aware of. Anything that is unfair, anything that is missing in terms of education, for example, in, in one country, in one place, is not just the problem of that one country, of that one place, of Africa, for example. It's a problem for everybody. Because sooner or later, it will affect everyone through violence, for example. And so new technologies are an opportunity for all of us, but, but there is something missing. What's missing is the sharing, as Jean-Michel was saying. Those who have lost, who have gained the most from the pandemic are multinationals, big companies, and they've made a lot of gains that will not be shared. Now, I, I hope, I wish that the pandemic brings about a change. If that change is going to happen, we have to change. Each person has to decide to be different after the pandemic a pandemic which is in fact going to change a lot of things. Now, the pandemic is going to change a lot of uh, things, in particular in the cultural sector. Now, the big uh, Apple, Amazon, Google, uh, uh, etc., are lobbying in Brussels to ensure that the new restrictions will not have a negative effect on their income. How can we ensure that artists get fair remuneration for their work? Well, thank you very much for answering that because I think it's important to put that question to the European Commission. Europe has a very important role to play for the rest of the world. Europe has always been uh, 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 synonymous with respect for uh, authors' rights and for culture compared to other continents. So any future measures or current measures that uh, are taken by the European Union will have a domino effect in other areas of the world, such as Africa, as uh, Abderrahman Sisako was saying, but other places as well. So we have 
autant que possible depuis quelques années. I've done a lot these past few years, and I've really been intensifying these efforts recently. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that what we need is uh, a vaccine. Well, you know, it already exists. It, it's called regulation. That's, you know, what differentiates democracy from chaos. The line is regulation. And regulations are not restrictions on freedom. They mean more freedom. They protect your freedom. Now, the big platforms have been kind of losing their uh, almighty strength over the past few years. And they understand that if they do not accept regulations, they, I mean, they've been saying that regulations would give them less freedom. It's a bit like saying if you uh, uh, are free to go on the highway at any speed you want, it's restrictive of, that speed limits are restrictive of your uh, freedom. But we, what we need is regulation simply to rebalance things. You have some operators that make huge sums of money off of those that produce the content and therefore we need to find a proper balance so i think that netflix is not too bad an example let's not forget that the difference between a movie platform like netflix and a music streaming service is the fact that they reinvest their money they take that money and they uh, put it back in creation, but the redistribution is not clear. Like if you take out, if you pay a monthly plan from one of those uh, platforms, uh, if during the month you have not listened to any uh, music, where does that money go? I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying that it's one example amongst others that shows that there's lack of clarity and that we need to rebalance things, make things fairer. Uh, something else about the uh, big gaffa in music. We realized during the pandemic that you had a lot of musicians that shared their art for free, streaming from home. Very generously they did so. Well, you know, we as, an, uh, as audiences, we should not consider that this is uh, normal. Uh, this would throw us back two centuries and reduce artists to beggars on the streets, you know, begging for money uh, whenever they uh, play, you know, like buskers. So, these big platforms do have to be a platform for expression, but we need to be able to monetize our own creation. That's one way of reacting positively uh, uh, in the face of platforms. Uh, now, you know that the internet is something very young, 20, 25 years old. It's like the Wild West. And the gaffas are indeed, uh, have set up shop in the West. It's no uh, coincidence. Thank you very much, Jean-Michel Jarre. Abderrahman, did you want to say something? Well, I wanted to say that Europe does provide us with hope uh, uh, and Europe does have to uh, be in the front line of that uh, fight. We don't have that strength in Africa. We have the, uh, we are united, but we don't have the strength. So Europe is a bulwark. We've seen the very negative effect of uh, the U.S. pulling out of UNESCO. We see the very negative effects this sort of thing can have. So we need to stand united. We need to get together to be stronger. And Abderrahman, you know, you know, one voice out of Africa is worth 10 voices from the U.S. or Europe. We absolutely need the African continent to get our rights as artists respected in those countries, uh, in those countries where it's difficult to express yourself, that's where you need that unity even more than anywhere else. That's why UNESCO as an organization is so important. Also why the European Union is an important voice. There's a directive that, uh, a, a directive that was voted at the European Union of, 
for the respect of uh, artistic and intellectual property. That is something that made us stronger with respect to YouTube, and it is by creating even closer bonds between artists that we are going to be able to stand stronger and come out stronger out of this uh, climate of insecurity. Uh, it's been our fault until now. We're in a kind of pa uh, pandemic tunnel, and I hope that this is going to be an opportunity for us to uh, stand close together and come out stronger. Thank you very much. Now, Thomas Stephens, you head up a streaming platform. Given that musicians and singers are currently in most countries unable to give concerts, and the only way for them to get an income is often uh, thanks to uh, royalties, have you ensured that the artists you have on your platform receive a fair payment? <laughs> have you changed your business model due, due to uh, the pandemic? Did you take any specific measures to increase uh, your artists' income? And maybe one uh, quick final question. Uh, what do you think of uh, about the idea of creating a minimal uh, a minimum per play compensation for artists? I think um, a, a minimum um, will help to, um, to stop a race to the bottom that we currently um, uh, see. And let me maybe give you one example on, uh, let's say, um, how a royalty allocation can create um, wrong incentives. Uh, the way that the YouTubes and Spotify's of this world allocate their royalties, they just count how often an artist has been streamed. But it doesn't matter if you have been streamed for one minute or for 10 minutes, you get the same 0 0.1 cent um, per stream. But, you know, um, for instance, jazz and classical and blues songs tend to be much longer than pop songs. All pop songs are typically around three minutes. But in jazz and blues and classical, one song or track or whatever you want to call it can be 10 to 20 minutes which means that a pop artist gets per hour, maybe he gets streamed 20 times by a user. Whereas this classical work maybe only gets streamed six times, 10 minutes. So then in the end, the pop artist gets three times as much per hour than, um, uh, the, uh, than the classical or the blues or the jazz artist. You can solve it by not paying out based on how often an artist is being listened to, but how long. Then you, don't, then you need to keep track of how long people are listening to music. That means more data consumption. It's more complexity. And then Spotify says, yeah, that's more work for us. We, we're not going to do it. It's the right thing to do. It's more work. We do it. We as a small organization do it. But the big guys, whether it's Spotify or Deezer or YouTube, they refuse to do it because it's extra complexity uh, for them. And um, the music, in the, let's say the artists don't have the power to force them to change um, um, their practices. But I think in the end, um, governments can, and I need. I have high hopes that the European Commission will act. Uh, I think, as we have seen, typically that the American government is too business-minded um, uh, to challenge them. Uh, in Europe, it takes long, but eventually, I think uh, the European Commission has, uh, let's say, uh, taken up the gloves to uh, to combat uh, the big guys because that's the only party that I will likely uh, listen to. Voilà des pistes. En tout cas, l'une des pistes qui semble émerger, c'est qu'il faut absolument changer. That's definitely an interesting avenue. Could I please add something, says Jean-Michel Jarre. Yes, just to pick up on what Thomas said, that's an excellent example. It does show how crucial it is for us to regulate platforms differently in a novel way. Now, everybody's saying about music, well, the pandemic was awful because people can't go out and play. Let's not forget that many musicians, uh, and it's not their job, uh, uh, are not trained to uh, play music on a stage. They're, uh, they're authors, they are composers, they are not performers. There's that whole part of the music industry that's, uh, that they're not even getting mentioned on the platforms. You know, the um, composers and uh, authors of the lyrics are not even uh, mentioned on platforms. There was a recent example in Britain of a uh, pop song author, a woman, that uh, wrote songs for Kylie Minogue's uh, last uh, album. It uh, streamed in all countries. You know how much she got paid in all? All in all, 100 pounds, a leading author of lyrics. Imagine a non-popular uh, author 
or someone, a composer in pop music, are not in pop music, those that do classical music, etc., they get zero cents from the music platforms. That's what we need to rebalance. And I don't think it's intentional on behalf of the, on the part of platforms. It's just that they grew so quickly that now we need that rebalancing readjustment. I'm sorry for having a butted in. No problem, not at all. That's a very interesting point of view. I'd just like to move on to the next question for Vanya, because it's already 12 past five in Paris, and we don't have time to cover all the topics. Vanya Kaludjocic, just to continue on these new challenges in the digital age. and not a threat. As mentioned uh, at the beginning of this debate, you are organizing currently your festival online. Have you already identified certain measures that should be implemented uh, specifically to adjust to the challenges po posed by the new technologies? Well, first, uh, I think it's good. I think it goes without saying that for us, indeed, the ability to develop a digital solution has offered an opportunity this year. Less than uh, 10 years ago, we simply could not have put on an international festival in these circumstances. So for us, the key will be to build on, on upon what we've developed for use in future editions. For that reason, I think a lot of knowledge sharing will have to take place and over time we'll be able to figure out what works and what doesn't to best serve the industry and audiences together in, uh, in this new paradigm as we refer to it quite a few times. But also speaking, uh, of the opportunities, I think uh, in the matter of, of a few months, we've gone from being an event hosting hundreds of thousands of people physically in our city to now truly exporting, ex exporting our brand virtually back across the globe. And moving forward for our local partners, uh, it's going to mean having a lot of thoughtful conversations with each of them about who they want to reach and how we can work together to best serve their needs and their expectations. Yeah. Thank you, Vania. Uh, Victoria Contreras, uh, can digital platforms and the internet be a useful tool to help the cultural world recover? Or do they represent a threat to you? And uh, again, what measures should be taken uh, to regulate this sector? Uh, Victoria, uh, your microphone is off. Sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry again. Well, yes, digital tools are very useful uh, in our work, in the work of many of the cultural managers, etc. And that I believe, strongly believe that internet access should be a human right in this moment, particularly for population with less access. There are examples of very understanding, no commercial internet, such as the case of Wi-Fi Net in Catalonia, which is free, neutral, self-managed, collaborative, collaborative, and low cost. That kind of internet most exists more in the world, especially in regions like mine, where the gap between digital access is huge. That's Thank you, it. Victoria. And uh, while we were um, getting ready for this debate, uh, lorsque on a préparé ce débat, uh, je vais le dire en français d'abord. When we were preparing for this debate, and I'll speak French first and then speak English because uh, we, I forgot that we have interpreters. So at the beginning, when we were preparing this, Victoria, you talked about gender inequalities uh, in the creative sectors, just like in other areas. What are your recommendations to reduce those inequalities? Could you ask me in English, please? I'll ask in English as well. I wasn't sure if the translation was working. So I was saying as we were, uh, as we exchange the emails to get uh, to prepare this debate, you told me that the, the issue you wanted to talk about was uh, the gender inequalities. So what do you think should be done to uh, reduce those inequalities? 
Well, uh, first of all, we must recognize women and girls as agents of change within their communities and value their achievements. I think UNESCO has a report, a, a pretty important report about the issue of gender. In the case of my country, I mentioned you, uh, gaps uh, are huge, still huge. In the case, uh, for example, of uh, my a personal history in cultural management, well, I have to say that it is not easy to work as an entrepreneur, cultural entrepreneur in my country. Even though, even the challenges, uh, we try to inspire more uh, girls and women to try to work in the cultural sector. Why? Because, um, when people feel more empower, empowerment in their own sector, we can make active change in our countries. And not only that, we can make much more benefits for our society. And the vision of girls and women have to be included in the debate. For that, I really appreciate that uh, UNESCO with Resilience Arts include women's and women's for Latin America, uh, that is my case, so, and Mexico, because I say the challenges are huge, but we are not, um, we are really, we have a really commitment uh, to improve the quality of the cultural services in our country. And ensure that women and men equally enjoy the right of the same access. I know in, our, in other sector, uh, the problems are the same, but I think cultural and artists can give to the society a very good peda pedagogy to understand that this is so important in our democratic and cultural lives. Gracias, Victoria. Uh, Vania, you're a role model. You, you're an example of a woman who succe succeeded in the cinema industry and you uh, work on a daily basis with other women in the industry. Uh, what is your opinion on gender inequality? How can it be reduced? What needs to be changed? Uh, World Economic Forum uh, provided us with a very sobering finding of uh, the global gender gap that was uh, published in 2019 and it reveals that gender parity will not be obtained for another 99.5 years and that was before the pandemic hit so um i can only imagine what is going to be at for 2020 and that was uh so you're right the gender parity is of essential importance uh, for our sector and i don't think uh Nobody needs me to tell them that inequality exists in our industry and we also know that there's a range um, of persuasive inequalities we encounter and participate in on a daily basis. So none of us will see gender parity in our lifetimes and no likely for many, it will not be the case for many of our children. However, I think it's important to address diversity on a broader scale than gender only. Uh, think, for example, of ethnicity, social background, and so on. It is also what we stand for as a festival. Only by including a greater plurality of voices can we ultimately achieve better representation and equality. IFFR uh, started 50 years ago as the voice of filmmakers who could not be heard anywhere else. And we should be very self-reflective -reflect about who we hire and who we put in positions to contribute rigorously to the conversations we are having. I need to be ensuring that there is an equal and diverse dispersation of uh, ideas represented in our selection committees as well. And this is critical and maybe seems a bit obvious, but still we need to always be taking a step back and looking where we need to be doing better. Et on va aussi poser la question aux gentlemen qui nous accompagnent. Je vais juste vous demander. Well, we can also ask the same question to the gentlemen who are with us. You're going to have to go quickly. We only have 10 minutes left. We still have a conclusion that we want to share with the main messages. So, gentlemen, what is your vision? Uh, question. Thomas, are you with us? I think your microphone sure. is off, so I, went, I was asking your opinion about this issue. 
Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, well, I think in the classical music world is a, is a bad example in the sense that if you look at, you know, for, uh, for 300 years, nearly all composers we know today are uh, men. Um, if you still look at, let's say, the biggest orchestras in the world, nearly all the conductors are uh, men. Um, but if you look, for instance, at the orchestras themselves, they are nearly 50-50. Um, um, so we really see a clear desire in industry to get to, um, to balance. But the honest answer is also it's taking 10, 20 years, I think, before the classical music industry uh, will be there. If I look at my own company, um, what we, um, we ensure, uh, let's say, uh, by measuring it, equal pay between men and women in the same departments. But uh, that having said, between departments, there are differences. And let me give an example. We have a large, let's say, team of software developers whose salaries are relatively higher because there is a big shortage in the labor market on software developers. And unfortunately, most software developers are men. So I think one of the causes also divide in the coming decades is that women tend to be underrepresented in, let's say, the expertise where there is most um, um, scarcity. Uh, so I would, I would really also, if we, I think we discussed today a lot that a part of the future of the arts is in technology. But then we also have to make sure that women will be equally part of, let's say, uh, the technological side to make sure that even when we get to same pay for the same job, we may still not end up with gender pay equality if women continue to be underrepresented in the more scarce, uh, let's say, expertises. So I okay, hope that, so a better say, representation of the women uh, that needs to uh, start there. Uh, Abderrahman Sissako? And you, Abderrahman Sissako. Well, I tend to be rather optimistic about these issues. If you look at the last 20 years, just look at France, which is the country I know best, the question of gender has progressed, progressed enormously. There's a lot more producers who are women, a lot more distributors who are women. So things are changing. I think that there's been a true change in mentalities. And even in Africa, there's more and more women making films, working with documentaries, directing. So you can see the change in mentalities. Of course, there's... Uh, pressure from from the political leadership uh, and there's a fight going on uh, at the at the local level but i think it's fair to say that things are changing jean-michel jarre in 1977 you wrote a song called where are the women who sont les femmes well uh, what shall we do about women i think that uh, there's less reason to ask that question because the women are there as as abdurrahman was saying they are increasingly present right there with us and in the field of of music we may have been among the the first to really uh give that that change a green light in, in my personal case i, I think that uh, I, w I work with a, a majority of women for 30 years now i've been working mm -hmm. with a majority of women so if i was going to have uh, equal representation they would have to be more men but i think that there's two aspects to take into consideration uh you you, you want to look at uh at who is working and you want to look at what you do uh, let me give an example recently i gave a concert in saudi arabia because i think it's important to actually go to those places where they don't have the same liberties i'm absolutely against boycotting those places that's your privilege as an artist to go there and for example i was able to demand that my concert was held outside and that women should be let in the same as men. Now that's the sort of gesture that we artists need to make in order to push society in the right direction. That particularly applies in those countries where the balance is not present or is more fragile than here. It is true that, it's, uh, that artists have that power to change mentalities. We've seen that throughout history. Now we have very little time left. I'm going to ask you all a question. Can you summarize briefly, which is the message you want your audience and the decision makers at the top planetary level to support culture and creative industries? I'm going to start with giving Victoria the floor. Merci. Culture again is part of the global solution and we have to encourage a radical change in public action and decision making making of the direction of culture in a, in a global uh, way, the arts and creativity. We need the enlightened 
the collaborative, collaborative leadership of decision makers so that the cultural is considered a strategic, productive, regenerative, innovative, and part of the solution in the pandemic and post-pandemic. This requires an unprecedented, unprecedented economic and social investment in corresponsibility with governments, companies, civil societies, and individuals. Well, we have to be much more explicit in the contribution of culture and the arts in the recovery of cities and populations. And finally, I, I want to add a comment with a Chilean colleague and her partner, that is Fabiola Leiva and Pablo Diaz. Make visible the understanding of the role on culture in life economic and social, in sustainable life, in communities. In this sense, it will be relevant to design, implement, and model strategies and tools for sustainable territorial development based on a cultural and creative economy perspective from a territorial, territorial approach. Finally, my colleague also, Carlos Lara, said that UNESCO should we work together with the G20 and the World Health Organization for the Recovery of People and Territories. Sisi Montilla, a Venezuelan and colleague say, new fiscal mechanism and laws to promote the patronage and finance, finance it not only for people, but for groups and cultural entrepreneurs. And finally, promote new forms of economy for the diversity of societies, culture should also be took from collective and solidarity economies. That's it. Thomas Stevens? Yes, for me, I think, and yet I think what we also learned today is to really advance the arts, we need more support uh, from governments. To get support from governments, we need to convince majorities among voters and in society. And I think what I learned from today, especially, is we need to create a narrative that does not only speak to people who love culture already, but we need to create a narrative that also speaks uh, to the skeptic uh, people. And I deeply believe that culture can make a major contribution to the challenges of the 21st century on the 21st century skills, etc. And we need to create a narrative that also, let's say, um, uh, uh, um, reaches out and convinces uh, the skeptic ones. And I hope that UNESCO can play, play a role in creating that narrative. And UNESCO is listening. I'm sure they'll, they'll do their best uh, leading uh, this fight. Uh, Vania Kaludzercic. What we uh, saw from the last financial crisis, uh, the devastating and obvious impact of cuts to our creative and cultural sector. And perhaps what's uh, underappreciated, however, is the harm that has been done to public discourse and to the health of our democracies as a consequence. If we as a global community value our abilities to monitor and defend human rights, we need to place an appropriate emphasis on that as a collective cultural project. We all understand the long-term difficult consequences of this pandemic that are ahead of us, but I would hope that the difficult conversation that will be needed starts now are treated proactively and with seriousness and with the honest public engagement that is deserved Culture cannot be an afterthought within a well-functioning well fun and just democracy. It can only be fundamental to it. Abderrahman Sissako? Je voudrais Les que... Oui, je voudrais que cette post-pandémie, après la... I would like this post-pandemic period not to start with Europe closing down upon itself and closing down its borders from, from fear of, of health issues and that that should close uh, the, the paths for artists all over the world. Europe has a tendency to close down upon itself. It fears migrants, it fears terror, and this time I think that they might also fear viruses and that this is going to lead it to close down all of its borders for so many people who already find it so difficult to cross the oceans and the borders. And that is particularly true of our artists. That is an important message indeed. Abdurrahman, thank you. Jean-Michel Jarre, would you like to conclude? I'd be glad to. I would like to send a message, a strong message 
to all governments, but also to all people. I want them and I want us to hear this message. Music and culture deserve respect. We have to respect it. We have to pay for it. We should have to pay fairly for it. And we must never forget that culture is one of the pillars of human rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean-Michel Jarre. And thank you all for having participated in this very rich and productive discussion. These are the uh, cultural professionals who remind you that there can be no economy without the, crea the creative industries. Ernesto Tono had to leave us because he's, fight he's fighting our fight elsewhere. He heard everything that was said. UNESCO has heard everything that was said, and it's going to pass it on to the decision makers. Thank, thank you. Thank all of the members of our audience for following the discussions. Thank you all and wishing you a very pleasant rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Merci. Merci. Thank you. Merci à tous. Thank you. C'était un plaisir. Ciao. Merci encore. Au revoir. Thank you all and goodbye.